Hello, folks. Today we're going to talk about Clarice Lispector. Hello, book friends. It's Alyssa. Welcome back to the channel. Hello, if you are new. I am very excited to do this, what is probably going to be like a very like rambly, just like scatterbrained, just gush over my recent Clarice Lispector read. Uh, but I wanted... <sighs> Why? I'm out of breath. Anyway, okay, so I... <laughs> Hi. Okay, friends, don't let the sweatshirt fool you. It is like 90 degrees out there. Yes, Jesus is power washing the deck, so you can all hear that. Hopefully I can no, like, tone it down in editing, but this is this is the only time I have to film videos because once he's done power washing, I am back on the manual labor. So anyway, Clarice Lispector, let's talk about the queen the wonderful Clarice. If you don't know who Clarice Lispector is, uh, I am going to enlighten you. She was born on December 10th in 1920. She was a Ukrainian-born Brazilian novelist and short story writer. Uh, she has a very unique narrative style and her themes are very intimate, introspective, and she has international acclaim. Um, she was born into a Jewish family in Western Ukraine and eventually her family had to flee to Brazil uh, as an infant. She grew up in Brazil. Eventually Eventually her family did move to Rio de Janeiro uh, when she was in her teens. She went to law school. She ultimately married a diplomat and she became probably one of Brazil's most well-known authors, or at least female authors. And she is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I read her complete stories a while back and I finally found myself a copy of it. It is not ideal because it is, you know, a discard from a library, but it is in decent condition. And I found this through Eric Carl Anderson, actually. He was talking about this particular edition of her short stories, and I was like, oh, well, I'm, I, that sounds interesting. I'm going to get them. And I actually got the entire audiobook because that was the easiest way for me to get uh, a copy of this. And I listened to all of them, and they, they, it's phenomenal. This collection is actually phenomenal, just in case you wanted to get a collection of her short stories. I like how this is set up. It is set up sort of chrono, it, well, not sort of, it's set up chronologically. So you don't just get to see the progression of her as an author, but you get to sort of see the progression of her as a human being. Um, as she gets a lot older, there's there's stories that talk a lot more sort of at being a frustrated author, being a frustrated person. I found this just such, this is, I don't, I don't often call books life-changing. I think that if I had to make a book life-changing, this would be life-changing in the sense that like, I can recall a shift in my reading and the things that I liked when I read this, this collection. Um, this opened up this world of writing and that I hadn't really read before and got me really interested in in her as an author and it just it really sparked like a love that I didn't know I would have obviously. So uh, I don't know what I'm saying. I just really am gushing because I love Clarice Lispector. Uh, so I highly recommend this. But anyway, uh, I then made for TBR Lowdown when we were picking our books for our year-long sort of reading. We read a few books, like six books every year as a group, and then talk about them on the podcast. I made Naomi put Near to the Wild Heart on that list so that I could start reading Clarice's novels and not get distracted by anything else be like, you must read her work. So we did just recently read this. We have not done our, our discussion yet because I did have COVID. So this is just going to be like my general thoughts in sort of like a gushing dump of me loving Near to the Wild Heart. I also feel like I can't talk about this on my own. And if I'm going to, this is going to be like a two hour long epic review breakdown, like going page by page and talking about all of the things that I've tabbed in this story. Um, and I don't know if anybody wants to watch that. And I don't know if I want to edit that. So this is really just going to be some high level thoughts to try to get you inspired, you know, Jones to pick up Clarice Lispector if you haven't already. But before that, I would love you guys to pick my next Lispector. Uh, I have A Breath of Life and uh, Aguavita, or sorry, Aguavia uh, here 
already. And I do like these additions. When you put them together, you do make her whole face. Um, I only have three quarters of her person, um, but one day I will get to the fourth one. Uh, but yeah, I am trying to figure out where to go next with the ones that I already own. So if you are a lover of Clarice Lispector, could you tell me which is the next one that I should read? Um, for my collection. And these are the translations. Near to the Wild Heart is by Allison Antrichen. Uh, I know that there's a couple different translators. And this is a new translation by Stefan Tobler for Agua Viva. And then uh, A Breath of Life is translated by Johnny Lorenz. Uh, so those are the translations that I own. And then this actual, the New Horizons Complete Stories is also like a newer translation of these stories. And these are translated by Katrina Dodson. And I really, I highly recommend this collection. Obviously I haven't read all the translations and that is something that we're gonna talk a little bit about, about Near to the Wild Heart, because I do want to read the other translation of this to see how they differ and if I still have the same like vehement love for it. Um, I will say that Near to the Wild Heart is the kind of book that I would probably sell my soul to read again for the first time. I would also say that I don't think Clarice Lispector is necessarily the kind of author you want to read passively in any way. You want to have your brain on because she is just, her writing is brilliant. There's so many layers. It, it seems incredibly simplistic uh, in some ways, uh, but there's subtleties to her writing, to what she's saying, to there's repetition and there's so many things that you can pick up on if you're paying attention. So I would definitely read the read Clarice Lispector as like an active, active reading process, uh, not just like frivolously because you want to have enjoyment. I mean, you can, but I think that you get more out of her when you're very actively focused on her writing and what she's doing with language and words and repetition and metaphor and all of that. So anyway, Near to the Wild Heart. <laughs> Near to the Wild Heart is her first novel, actually, and it is about Joanna. We meet her and she's a young girl and she's living with her dad and she is very much like encouraged to to think and to create and to speculate and ruminate and be incredibly cerebral by her father. And she sort of seems like she's kind of left to herself to have these very like cerebral, cerebral moments. I mean, we meet her and she's like, daddy, daddy, I wrote a poem. You want to hear it? Anyway, so she says, daddy, I've made up a poem. What's it called? The son and I, with only a slight pause, she recited, the hens in the yard have eaten two worms but I didn't see them. Well, what does the son and you have to do with the poem? She looked at him for a moment. He hadn't understood. The sun is above the worms, daddy, and I made up the poem and didn't see the worms. Pause. I can make up another one right now. Hey, son, come play with me, or a longer one. I saw a little cloud. Poor worm. I don't think she saw it. Lovely, darling, lovely. How do you make such beautiful poems? It isn't hard. You just make it up as you go along. She's this incredibly like precocious child and her father does indulge her, her whims at her thinking and her creativity. But eventually her father dies and she has to move in with her aunt and her uncle. And her aunt and her uncle are like much more conventional, traditional people, very religious people. And they see this very unconventional, creative, a uh, cerebral young woman as this devil almost, as this vixen, as this evil, not normal person. And there's a lot of contention there. The aunt calls her like a little demon at my age with my experience after raising a daughter who's already married, Joanna leaves me cold. I mean, what a horrible thing for your aunt to say about you, right? Her aunt goes on at some point and she says, she's a strange creature about Joe with neither friends nor God. May he forgive me. Her aunt calls her a viper, a cold viper. There is no love or gratitude in her. There's no point liking her, no point doing the right thing by her. I think she's capable of killing somebody. These are such horrible things for the person who is supposed to be taking care of you and being your new family, your new mother to say about you and for you to hear these things. Um, and really Joanna is just trying to articulate and, and, find a way to release all of the creative 
things, the ideas, the thoughts, the the interpretations of the world around her out so she can get people to understand her. Uh, there is this longing for understanding, acceptance, and, and maybe love in some ways, motherly love in a lot of ways, uh, familial parental love. Um, but it's not as simple as that. I think that everything that I say in this little like love bomby sort of dump of random thoughts nothing is as simple as me breaking it down into little like bullet points of themes suggests um there's so many layers to what the specter is doing in here and it's just it's so beautifully done but anyway so she goes on joanna goes on to she doesn't change herself so much but she does attempt to fit herself into conventional society so she does get married she meets a man she finds him attractive she gets married um and she attempts to live a life where she is the wife but she never quite can do it and she can even eventually her husband goes back to the more conventional woman that he passed up for joanna and that honestly doesn't even bother her when Octavio does that. Octavio's her husband. Octavio was in a potential relationship with this this very traditional woman, Lydia, uh, and he leaves her uh, for Joanna. But eventually he ends up having this uh, affair with Lydia, and this is the more conventional life that Octavio imagine being married uh, he was he's living that with Lydia while being married to Joanna and uh, there is a scene where the, the the mistress and the wife confront each other and nothing goes the way one would expect it to when Octavio finds that out that, that Joanna even knows Joanna's ambivalence to it all makes him angry um, Joanna never behaves the way that anyone expects her to she sees the world differently. She thinks differently. She has different wants and needs and desires. And no matter how hard she tries to fit herself into a conventional life, it doesn't work for her. She feels stifled. Um, she doesn't seem to feel free until she has her own affair and she gets to release this like wild beast inside of her. She gets to live for herself and her desires. And I love that she has this moment where she gets to release in that way. And that's kind of the the general plot of this novel without going into all the details. So there's still some surprises for you. But throughout that, there's several themes that Co that run through the whole novel that are there's a lot of ticking of clocks and water and the movement of water and this idea of time and ebbing and flowing and the sort of circular nature of life there's a lot of discussion of life and death and um eggs eggs come up a lot and i found the egg thing incredibly interesting because in in the beginning of this novel there's a scene where her father is kind of holding an egg and talking about creation and Clarice as Clarice the Spectre as a as a Jewish author um there is a lot of discussion sort of of religion in this novel uh and how Joanna maybe isn't exactly religious she doesn't follow those conventions she isn't uh being led by those traditions in in a lot of ways she is led by herself and by her thinking and by her in, like in, intuition not her intuition but her like intrinsic um her being like her mind her her thoughts her interpretations of the world she's not maybe necessarily dictated her actions aren't necessarily dictated by uh religion or social convention or anything like that but i found the egg really interesting because it made me think about um, Passover, and I know that the egg on the Seder plate is incredibly important, and I'm not Jewish, so I did look this up about the symbolism of eggs on, on the Seder plate and uh, as a traditional food of mourning, so I feel like it plays into this whole idea of like life and death that is continuously going on throughout this novel. Um, you know, eggs are birth, but there's also this idea of like death and mourning that's also associated with it. Um, what I found is that the round shape symbolizes the cycle of life. In Aramaic, the egg is called beya, which is also prayer or please. Uh, the egg is a symbol of mourning, is a symbol of mourning the past, but also symbolizes hope for the future. When the chicken lays an egg, the egg appears to be a complete object, yet in truth, it isn't complete. The egg is just a preparation for the live creature that will emerge from it. And I got this from Ch Chabad 
org. There's an article on the egg and Passover, and I thought it was really interesting um, to sort of layer that uh, religious context uh, on top of this whole story. I mean, we start with this chicken, there's a discussion of eggs, there's this whole back and forth with life and death. Um, there's all these scenes where she sort of goes to the ocean or she hears water and there's this almost like purifying moment uh, that comes when she has these moments with with the ocean, standing at the ocean and sort of being washed clean or having these big sort of transcendental transcendental mo moments when she is she is at the ocean. She's a woman struggling to find her voice and to have a place in a world where she doesn't have a place to exist. I love watching this struggle and I relate so much to this idea of having like big ideas and big things inside of you and and trying so hard to find a way to to articulate them and to relate to others and to relate your ideas or to express your ideas in a way that is relatable to others so that people can understand you and not see you as something else. I mean, she's so misunderstood throughout this entire novel. And we get to this end where she's again, she's having this big moment that is like almost like a cry. Uh, she's having this big emotional moment. She says things like, God, why do you not exist in me? Why did you make me separate to you? God, come to me. I am nothing. I am less than dust. I wait for you every day, every night. Help me. Uh, I have only one life and this life slips through my fingers, travels to death serenely, and I can do nothing. And all I do is watch my depletion with each passing minute. I am alone in the world. Those who are fond of me don't know me. Those who know me fear me and I am small and poor and I won't know I existed in a few years time. All that is left for me is to live a little and yet all that is left for me to live will remain untouched and useless. Why do you not take pity on me? I mean, what a cry. I feel like that's the cry for this whole book is just Joanna just trying so hard to be her and have people understand her and to have people love her um, while they understand her. And this cry at the end is this, it, it's the culmination of this simmering that happens through the entire novel. And I just, oh, it's such a beautifully done book. Um, I have so many thoughts here that I don't even know how to group them together. But I would say that like the biggest themes that are in this is this idea of creation and life and death and how we're living these sort of like cyclical lives and how unescapable it all is. And eventually all things are going to decay and end. This fight to exist as an unconventional woman in a world that doesn't have a place for you, uh, a struggle for acceptance, a struggle to find your creative outlet and your means to be understood. Um, there's discussion of uh, marriage and wifedom a little bit in here, which I always find incredibly, incredibly interesting as a topic. I mean, Octavio's life is is fun, is is enhanced by marriage, and Joanna ends up being caged. She ends up being hemmed in. She ends up being suffocated by marriage and Octavio has escaped. Octavio goes. He can have his little life with Lydia and he comes back and he has his little life with his wife and his life is made better through marriage and he is not stifled. His presence and more than his presence, knowing that he existed, took away her freedom. Only rarely now in a quick escape was she able to feel. That was it. It was his fault. How hadn't she discovered it earlier? She wondered ferociously. He stole everything from her, everything. And since the phrase was still weak, she thought intensely, her eyes closed, everything. He, she felt better, she thought, with more clarity. Before him, she always had her hands out. And how much, oh, how much did she receive by surprise, by violent surprise, like a ray of sweet surprise, like a rain of little lights. Now all of her time has been forfeited to him. And she felt that the minutes that were hers had been seeded, split into tiny ice cubes that she had to swallow quickly before they melted and flogging herself to go at a gallop. Look, because this time is freedom. Look, think quickly. Look, find yourself quickly. Look, it's over there now, only later. The tray of ice cubes again, and there you are, staring at it in fascination, watching the droplets of water already trickling. 
Then he'd come, and she'd finally rest with a sigh heavily, but she didn't want to rest. Her blood ran through her more slowly. It paced domesticated, like a beast that had trained its steps to fit in its cage. Yes, like, she is an absolute genius. And I don't even know if this is like an articulate vomiting of love for this novel, for Clarice Lispector as an author, for what she is doing. Um, but I think that there's, there are so many passages in here, as, as particularly as a woman, uh, I think you can like, you can appreciate and love this even as a man. That's not um, to, to say that this isn't for, this is only for women, but there's so many passages, passages in here that are so relatable as a woman. Um, I know that this is a topic that like a lot of us talk about, you know, when you're talking to your girlfriends, this idea that like, when you were single, when you were you, you had this freedom. It's often an intangible thing. It's like now there is space taken up in your brain and in your thought waves to make sure that uh, the home is cleaned, um, that you pick up after this other person, that, oh, I've got to make sure that I have this meal prepared and I have to make sure that this is done and I have to make sure that that's happening. And there's all this space that is taken up with the expectations of womanhood, the expectations of wife done, the expectations of a woman in a relationship, um, where you have to take on all this extra burden and it ends up suffocating the other parts of you because it takes life away from it. It takes time away from it. It takes space away from your ability to create or to write or to, um, paint or to whatever, because time is such a finite and valuable resource. And if I have to kick that time to um, making your dinner when I may have on my own just had a snack uh, and that would have been sufficient, you know, um, or I have to now negotiate things around the schedule of another human being, um, it changes the dynamics of your creativity and your personhood. Um, and I just think that like this just so beautifully captures that. And there's so many books that I've been reading recently that capture that idea of wifedom, that job of wifedom, the ways that that changes your creativity, your existence, your, your life, your mental space. Um, and I, I, I just, I loved Clarice's voice, uh, being added into that canon of, of, um, discussion. Um, Hurt that voice being added to the discussion. It is a beautiful, beautiful book. I, I, I just need you all to read it. I don't know what else to say because I, I, I really feel like to truly do this book justice, you have to go through chapter by pa chapter, line by line, page by page, and really break down what is happening in this. Before we end here talking about this, I'm going to read the little beginning uh, here because I, I like the the onomatopoeia of like this, the uh, the the sounds of. Of her writing as well. It's very rhythmic in, in, in places and it opens like that and it kind of ends like that with this ticking of clocks, which is also very similar to Mrs. Dalloway, which I was reading around the same time where you have the clocks ticking throughout this day and you can follow time and time is a very heavy presence in, in, in both novels actually. But anyway, and this actually reminded me of another Brazilian author and the pleck, pleck, pleck of the uh, typewriter. And I feel like that may have been a nod to Clarice the Spectre. But anyway, so this starts with her father's typewriter went clack, 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 clack. The clock awoke in a dustless tindinel. Tin, tin the silence dragged out. Zzz. What does the wardrobe say? Close, close, close. No, no. Amidst the clock, the typewriter, and the silence, there was an ear listening, large, pink, and dead. The three, the three sounds were connected by the daylight and the squeaking of the three little leaves rubbing against one another, radiant. Like, it's, she opens with just this, cacophony of sound and silence. And I, I love it. I absolutely, absolutely love it. And uh, yeah, so I, I need you all to read this. Uh, I need you to tell me which of these two I am reading next, uh, A Breath of Life and Agua Viva. Uh, I think that I've prattled on entirely too long with basically no cohesive thought about Near to the Wild Heart, but I hope that it gives you some uh, idea of what you're getting yourself into and maybe has inspired you to pick it up. And when I do finally do that discussion with Naomi, I will also link that down below because I think there will be a lot of really interesting discussions that come from that. And I, and I would love to know more about sort of the symbolism of egg, maybe not just in like 
Judaism, but also like in other kinds of cultures. I know it comes a lot up a lot in like pagan culture, and there's it's always this idea of um, you know rebirth, um, creation, uh, new life. Um, but I really liked this other component of mourning uh, that was given to it from that article that I read uh, about the egg on the Seder plate and Passover and its symbolism. So anyway, uh, if you know more about that, I'd love to hear more about that from you down below, because obviously it's not something that is like, I'm really familiar with, but I thought it was a really beautiful and interesting uh, little tidbit to throw into the mix while thinking about life, creation, death, eggs, <laughs> religion, all that. So anyway, I don't know how I'm going to edit this, but we're going to try. Uh, hopefully I've made this coherent. Let me know your thoughts on Clarice Lispector if you've read her. Uh, if you do read her, if you're inspired and go read her, please come back and tell me what you thought of the book and her writing. I'm also going to link this video, uh, a YouTube video of an interview of, with her that is really interesting. I mean, she is I love her so much. She is a badass. I wish I, I wish I had been alive and I could have met her, but she died in 1977. So that was never going to happen. But anyway, thank you guys for watching. Like and subscribe and I will see you in my next video, whatever it may be, because it's my channel and I can do whatever I want. Bye. So just sit